I'm Allison Singer with the Autism Science Foundation, and I'm here now with Dr. Eric Corshane, who gave an amazing keynote this morning here at the International Meeting for Autism Research. In fact, people are calling you the rock star of the IMFAR. <laughs> there is just huge energy after your talk. Um, why don't you just give me a brief synopsis of what you talked about today about the underlying biology of autism and what we are learning about the autistic brain? Well, briefly, Early on, we discovered there's early brain overgrowth in many children with autism. We pinpointed that with MRI. We reduced it to a local region of the brain, the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. They're involved in social and language communication functions, which are a problem in autism. So knowing that those are regions that are affected, we used new technology involving counting the number of brain cells that are that are located there, looking at the genes and how those genes are operating in frontal cortex. We wanted to find out why this overgrowth occurred in early life. And we figured if we could find signals of what caused it to overgrow, those signals might tell us when autism begins biologically and what causes it. We discovered that there are far too many brain cells that are produced in the frontal cortex. And we discovered genes that are responsible for that because they dysregulate or fail to govern the total number of cells that are generated and then they fail to sort through the cells that are healthy and to be kept and get rid of the cells that aren't good. So the failure of getting rid of cells, the production of too many cells in the end, and all that's in prenatal life in the second trimester, it means that in the end when the baby is born who ultimately will become autistic, they're faced with a problem. That problem is way too many brain cells. Those brain cells produce way too many connections. Those connections are not all good connections. They're kind of a jumble of confusing connections. And then eventually the brain figures out how to get rid of the excess. So across decades, there's this gradual loss of these brain cells. I hope and I think it may have something to do with the attempt of the brain in autism to remove the problem cells, remove the problem connections, and remodel the brain for healthier function. And maybe that's why many autistic kids get better. It also means that if you could start that in the first year of life and invoke early behavioral interventions that are really successful in, in preventing bad connections from being made of the excess, it might be that earlier on you have more successful connections, so later you don't have to take away the bad connections, which is a lot harder to do. So early intervention probably has a basis uh, in the research we see right now. And so we're really excited. Autism is a lifespan. It begins in the second trimester. It's a problem that the brain is dealing with for several, several decades. And I, I think that every age is super important to study. Getting in early will make a difference in producing healthier connections and preventing unhealthy connections being made. And then working with the older adolescent and adult with autism, there's still rewiring going on. We need to know what is responsible for improving that rewiring. We need to study the recovery genetics of autism. And I thought that was such an interesting term when you said that today, the genetics of recovery. It's really just a very optimistic way of looking at it. And I think to me, one thing that was so amazing about your keynote was it really was a convergence of all of the disciplines that we've been hearing about at IMFAR for the last few years. I mean, it's very unusual to hear a neuroscientist like yourself talk about genetics and early intervention. So talk a little bit about that. How are, is your work really leading us to a convergence of all of the other things that we've been learning about autism over the last few years? It's, uh, it probably comes from my background. As, a, as, a, as, as a, you know, Dr. Gashwin mentioned uh, this morning in, in introducing me, you know, I had polio as a child. So I understand what it means to have a disability. I understand what it means to have people aim to try to understand how they can help you recover from the disability. Myself, I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't walk, I couldn't stand when I was a child. But through medical interventions, eventually I achieved the capacity to, uh, to act and behave in a normal way, getting around, swimming, you know, playing with my kids, even gymnastics. So I believe in recovery. I believe that even, and polio, for those of you that may not know it, because actually polio is a, is a disease that most people don't experience anymore, that's because vaccines prevent polio. 
without vaccines, people like me and would, would still be around. But no, we have vaccines. There's no more polio. You probably don't know what it is. It's a virus that attacks the nervous system. It kills uh, cells in your spinal cord. And those are the cells that control your motor function. So when you lose those cells, you can't stand, you can't walk. So it, it's hugely important to me, and I understood this as a child, that working towards the recovery of children who have neurological disorders is the most important uh, thing that I could do with my life. And I believe in recovery because I went through it. Medical science made a difference for me, and I believe that medical science can make a difference for autistic kids. The second thing that really struck me in your keynote was that you redefined what we mean by lifespan. I mean, when we talk about looking at the lifespan of an individual with autism, we really look at their, their trajectory. But what you talked about today is that we have to really look at children at different stages of life because their brains look different. So can you talk a little bit about that, what we're seeing in children uh, prenatally, and then how their brains change over time? Yeah, so that, that's one of the really exciting things to me because <clears throat> I've searched for these questions, I've searched these questions my lifetime as a scientist. And at first, like everybody else, I was looking for like one single answer. But the more I searched, the more I realized, well, there's, there's an answer here and here and here, and they're all different at different ages. So our data is pointing to the second trimester during a period of, of very few weeks when there's a tremendous production of brain cells. And we found evidence that there are too many brain cells in the very young autistic individual. We found evidence that what generates those brain cells, that is a cell cycle me a mechanism that generates cells, may um, ordinarily has a, a way of catching errors in the production of those cells checking for the errors and either correcting the genetic errors in a cell or if it can't be corrected removing the cell so that you don't have a cell with bad dna producing dysfunctional neural neural activity our data show that there may be a down regulation which means a lowering of the functional activity of that process of checking that sets up a, a, it means that you you're setting up a cascade of pathology where now you keep cells, instead of throwing them away, you keep cells that may be problematic. Those cells are kept, they migrate, and they may be creating patches of abnormality. And so the autistic brain may not only have more cells overall, but there may be local areas where there's cells that are especially defective, producing especially defective functioning. So now what happens? When the child is born, too many brain cells, too many connections, and patches of aberrants. What's the normal child born with? A normal number of brain cells ready to go. They are set and prepared to learn. I've got the cells, I've got the axons, tell me what I need to learn and experience. And that's what the environment gives the normal brain. So the normal brain doesn't have to go through any process of tearing things apart, removing things. It's ready to grow, it's ready to grow and go. In autism, it's not like that. It's, it, the, the child seems to be born with an excess of cells, these patches, and abnormal connections. And the longer one waits, the more connections that are made that are ab aberrant. So <clears throat> think of it as neural noise that's being produced. So the child now at the age of one or two is faced with trying to sort through this noise and they're not able to gain from learning and experiences and making connections. And what we have noticed and what others have noticed is that around that age, you begin to see a, a type of cell become activated. It's in the brain, it's called a microglia cell. That cell becomes activated. You begin to see changes in the pattern or distribution of cells. And what uh, we in my laboratory have found is that this seems to signal the effort of the brain to undergo a gradual remodeling of, the, of, of neural circuitry with um, microglia wrapping around cells, with cells beginning to fade away or die, perhaps because they weren't good cells. So across a span of time, you see a remodeling that produces a different brain than was there at birth. And that's just sort of incredible. It's, it's, it's a never-ending process of change and the attempt to improve and the attempt to correct. 
And you also talked a little bit in your keynote about the underlying biology of early intervention and why it's so important to get in early when there's more neuroplasticity. Can you talk a little bit about that? So when the, so the frontal cortex and the temporal cortex are parts of the brain that are really key for human social emotion, language, and communication. You gotta have those, they're the basis of development. And what's beautiful about them is unlike other parts of the brain that are specialized for just being able to see what's going on or hear what's going on, they mature fast, but the frontal cortex matures slowly. And the reason is that social communication and language are incredibly complex functions and they heavily depend on learning and sort of in-person experience, interacting with mom. And so the cells at the time uh, uh, the brain is born in front of the cortex are very small and they have very few connections. It's the last part of the brain to really wire up. It wires slowly. The reason it wires slowly is because it wants to wire correctly. The reason it wants to wire correctly is because what makes us unique as human beings is a capacity to very, um, very slowly acquire incredibly complex information about emotional expressions and nuances, how people respond to you and how you respond to them. That takes, that takes scores, hundreds, perhaps thousands of interactions. So the brain wants to grow slowly. So what's really fascinating and what's really important to know is that the, the, the frontal lobe is, and the temporal lobe are really important for these higher order human functions. You know, the things that make us really special, you know, our ability to understand the complex social intentions and signals and communications of someone else. And for us to be able to think about what it is that, that, that is important to us and, 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 in, and impart that meaning and our feelings about that meaning to someone, to someone else so they can understand how we feel. This is an incredibly complicated learning process. It takes years. So the frontal cortex is designed to grow slowly. Neurons are small at, at the beginning in, 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 the, in the newborn, very few connections, and it's that um, beauty of social interactions that drives the gradual growth so that you have maximum benefit of experience to select the pattern of circuit making in frontal cortex. And we know that individuals who are more capable grow more slowly. Individuals who are less capable actually grow more rapidly. And in autism, you grow the fastest of all. So what we're thinking is that biology that goes wrong and drives the making of connections before social experiences can guide them. The biology that goes wrong is undermining the capacity to develop real normal understanding of social communication. Instead, it's making connections that aren't necessarily adaptive, not necessarily informative, and ultimately may be harmful and possibly quite confusing so that the autistic child may, may have circuitry that makes them quite confused about what's going on and quite distressed. And they probably want to really interact and understand other people and they want other people to understand them. But it's kind of like there's too many wires and they're tripping over all these wires and they, they, they can't, get, their, they can't them, get themselves across because there's just too, mu too much <laughs> in the way. And so the first thing they have to do is get rid of all this excess before they can actually begin to communicate. And it's a beautiful experience to see a child with, who's, who seems to have a profound disability when they're two or three grow, improve. And I've seen kids that by the time they're eight or 10 are beginning to really function very normally. And I've seen individual autistic kids that actually re, re, you know, become fully capable and are indistinguishable from any person that never had autism in the first place. So recovery is possible. And I know autistic kids that don't recover. So I think as a field, we should be thinking of how we can understand the biology that um, makes it possible for some to go from this area of problem to success. Uh, and if we understood that, then maybe we could figure out the genetics, and then pharmaceutical or other interventions that help the others that seem to be having more difficulty achieve more success, if not the same success, at least much more success than they otherwise would. 
That's what we need to do. And one thing that you identified as being critical towards making that happen is brain tissue research. And I think uh, in the past year or so, people have started to question the need for brain tissue research when we're hearing so much about stem cell research. And, and is do we still need to focus on brain when we have stem cells? Maybe talk a little bit about why you think that brain tissue research is still so critical. Well, we need to know what's actually going wrong inside uh, the tissue that's responsible. What's responsible for autism is, is brain tissue. And it's the way the brain circuit in its great complexity um, is, is not forming correctly. Our research with, with brain tissue has shown us that there's a whole series of operations that are critical to the development of the cerebral cortex that go wrong in the second trimester. This is a very complex system, and the only way we'll know the complexity is by actually studying the system itself. Well, through postmortem brain tissue, it is possible to get a window on exactly what's happening uh, with the brain. And can you get the same thing with, uh, with what's called iPS cells or in induced pluripotent stem cells? Possibly, but possibly not. Because our research suggests the possibility that one of the things that really distinguishes or causes autism to be really um, a, a disorder that's hard to recover from is that genetic defects may emerge in the process of brain development. And it's those genetic defects that in turn produce a failure for the normal organization and growth of cortex. So if spontaneous mutations are taking place in the developing brain tissue itself, you are never going to be able to see those by studying stem cells. If I take a stem cell from here or from here, is that telling me what actually happened in real time? No. On the other hand, I can imagine a large number of very important things that can be done with stem cells and autism. It's just that there's room for both and essentially they are two sides of, they could end up being two sides of a very important story. And if you only know part, if you only know one side, you're not gonna know the whole story. Brain research is going to inform what to do with stem cells. Stem cells could tell us what to look for in brain tissue that we wouldn't otherwise guess about. And because brain tissue is precious and rare, knowing from stem cells, you know, some clever little quick, you know, shortcuts might enable us to maximize the use of uh, the precious rare postmortem tissue. And conversely, molecular biology is gigantically complicated. So where do you start if you've got a stem cell? What do you study? What most people do is they say, well, let's study based on what we know about some other disorder. Well, maybe autism doesn't have to do with that disorder. Wouldn't a more sensible thing be to start asking your questions from actual knowledge of real autistic brain tissue? And doesn't the autistic child really deserve that? Isn't it really true that they deserve to be understood from the inside out and the outside in? You know, that's what we're trying to do. So I think it's important to do both types of research. They both inform each other, and they both maximize the research that will be done and the dollars that are spent on each type of research. Well, I want to thank you again for your great keynote. It was really just energizing to everyone sitting in the audience. People are still talking about it. Thank you, and also thank you for being with us here today. Okay, thanks. It was great. I enjoyed talking with you, Allison.